So, um, I'm a playwright, which generally means that uh, I write the words for other people to stand up and say. So the fact that I'm here myself is a little bit not entirely comfortable. Um, I'm also sometimes a historian of science, which means that the people who actually do science like to point at me and laugh. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, I'm going to risk their scorn, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the stories that we choose to tell about science. Um, as Kristen just said, I wrote a play for the last Fringe Festival here called Rocket Town, which was about two teenagers growing up in Woomera, which, as many of you probably know, is the defence town in the South Australian desert, which was started in the late 1940s as a base for experimental rocket research. Uh, the play was about these two young people, Jess and Josh, and their experiences of growing up in this isolated and really quite extraordinary town. Um, it was based on conversations that I'd had with people that live up in Woomera now. Um, and as you can imagine, in the run-up to the production, I had to talk about this quite often and uh, describe it to people for marketing and all that sort of thing. And uh, sometimes I would get this question. Where's the science? And it sort of stopped me in my tracks because it was going on here at the Science Exchange. To me, it was obviously a play about science. But I will give you this. It didn't have any of the research in it. It didn't have the people doing the research. It had the kids of the people doing the research. And, uh, and the impact that living in a place that existed for that research, the impact it had on their lives. But the fact that I was asked the question makes me want to ask <laughs> another question. What should it mean, or what does it usually mean, to say a story is about science? Um, it sort of makes me think about the stories we hear about science. Are they, and these are real questions, I just, I'm really asking you, um, are, they, are they stories about scientific heroes? Are they stories about discovery and invention? Are they this kind of grand narrative? Because I'm not sure that's what I want to talk about when I want to tell stories about science. Because to me, there's something much broader than that. Um, Science exists in the world. We all interact with it every day. We interact with science and technology. We have the internet. We have our phones. We have all of this. And we can tell stories about the people who are peripheral to the science as well as those people who are right in the middle of it. Um, there's a particular challenge that writing drama about science presents, which is, which is this. Um, science, if you like, as we're taught to understand it, is sort of, sort of if you like, in the blue corner in that it's supposed to be objective and rational and cold in many ways, in that um, when you're taught how to write up an experiment at school, you are told that you need to write, the beaker was filled with water. You're never supposed to write, I filled the beaker. You're supposed to absent yourself from this. Uh, it's, like, it's like the person comes out of the narrative. Theatre, on the other hand, is over in the red corner, where it's all about desires and conflict and human experience. And so what you've got to do when you're trying to write drama about science is to go looking for that. Um, if I was to, for example, just put on stage uh, a description of the experiment, it would be really boring. Um, it, it's, it's not what you want. If you want that, you can read about it in the paper. You can go to a lecture, you can watch a documentary. But you don't want that if you go to the theatre. You want to go and engage with these people, you want to feel empathy for the characters, you want to be moved, you want to be entertained. You know, if you go away thinking something new, that's great. But probably the reason it will stick with you, if it does, is because you relate to the characters. Um, so when you go looking for this human story in science, there's, um, there's quite a lot in the history and sociology of science, which is the other thing I do, um, that is really good at exploring those aspects of science which aren't necessarily in that core that we think of when we think about science. Um, there's, there's been some really good work done in the last few decades about, say, um, the effect of funding on scientific work, like who, were, who was giving money to Galileo when he was looking at the moon of Jupiter? 
um, there's been some really interesting work about gender in physics labs and how that affects the work that's done there. And there's also quite an interesting um, zone where people are looking at um, users of technology and people in the world. And uh, it's this stuff that I think is really, really <coughs> worth looking at because these are the stories that don't get told. These are the people who disappear from the narrative. They're the people who are invisible in history. It's, um, there's actually there's a paper called Invisible Technicians, which will tell you all about um, the technicians who worked for gentlemen scientists in the 17th century and how nobody knows who they are. And it's these sorts of people, like the kids of the people doing the research out in Woomera, that I want to hear those stories. I think they're worth hearing. I think they're worth telling. And uh, before I get off, because I'm sure I'm nearly out of time, um, there's, there's a story that I know quite well that um, I just want to leave you with. The story starts, and this is, this is a real historical story. The story starts with um, a ship called the HMS Beagle. You've probably heard of it. Um, the Beagle leaves from England in late December 1831 and goes on a voyage around the world. Um, there's a young, ambitious naturalist on board who hopes to make his name from this voyage. And who thinks they know who I'm talking about? And who would that be? Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin is the obvious one. The, there was actually uh, another naturalist on board who was, in fact, the official naturalist. His name was Robert McCormick. And uh, he was so angry that the civilian, Darwin, who, by the way, whose dad paid for his, his voyage around the world, he was so angry that Darwin had usurped his position that he left the voyage four months in. And then, when he came to write his memoirs, he completely wrote the Beagle out of his life story. And uh, it was the middle of, I think it was the 1960s, before historians pieced that together and noticed that this, this was the guy who originally was the naturalist on the Beagle. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff in there that's about status and about money and about who wins and why they do. And uh, I'm just going to leave you with that thought. Thanks a lot.